Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn. And in today's show, I'm talking to Lauren Rhodes about our mutual love of cemeteries, graveyards and ossuaries. We talk about why we find such places so interesting and peaceful, as well as some of our favourite places in Europe and the US. Now, I particularly love Lauren's description of our interest in such places as being not death obsessed, but life obsessed. The idea of memento mori, remember you will die, helps us to make the most of the moment because life is so short. Now, I've just got back from a six day walking pilgrimage, the Beckett Way or the Pilgrim's Way from Southwark in London to the Shrine of Thomas a Beckett at Canterbury Cathedral. And all along the way, I visited churches and cemeteries and I'll be doing a solo show on that walk soon. But it made me think of how transient life is and how we have to make the most of the time we have. Now, Thomas a Beckett was martyred 850 years ago, and pilgrims have been walking this particular trail in the southeast of England since a few years after his death. So all of those people, and there are many, many thousands of pilgrims, and, you know, their names are not remembered, they are gone and forgotten. It made me think so much about the passing of time and about how we need to make the most of our lives, especially when we consider that in a couple of generations, no one will even remember our names. And I actually find that strangely comforting because it means that we can, we have permission to make the most of our lives. So that's the question for you today as you listen to our conversation. How can you make the most of the life you have? I hope you enjoy the interview with Lauren. Lauren Rhodes is the author of 199 Cemeteries to See Before You Die and Wish You Were Here, Adventures in Cemetery Travel, as well as paranormal romance novels, short stories and essays. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you and I've been, I I love your work and your blog is so fascinating and you share so much. But first up, tell us a bit more about you and how you became so interested in cemeteries. (laughs) <laughs> it was by accident. I grew up in a little farming town in Michigan, and uh, down the road from the farm was this cemetery where my family was buried. So one year when my mom couldn't figure out how to entertain us over the summer, she took us down there and taught us how to do gravestone rubbings. And it was the first time I'd seen my grandfather's grave, and I have a cousin that was born about the same time as me, but died as an infant. And I'd never really thought about death before that. I knew my grandfather was gone, but I, I hadn't thought about gone where, really. That was my first introduction to cemeteries. And then years later, when my husband and I were going to Europe for the first time, a friend said, you have to go to Père Lachaise. And I thought, geez, how weird is that? You're going to make a trip to a cemetery. But we were there in January, so we pretty much had the place to ourselves. And I was just stunned by the little family tombs and all the amazing sculpture and famous people buried there. At that point, somebody had gone through the graveyard and chalked Jim and an arrow on all these, all over the cemetery on all the tombs. And if you followed the arrows, they led you to Jim Morrison's grave. And that was my, my first introduction to like the cult of celebrity, that people actually travel to cemeteries to see famous people. It wasn't the famous people that struck me. It was the beauty of the place when I got there. Yeah, I agree. And I I love Père Lachaise. It's it's gorgeous. It's in Paris, if people don't know. And as you say, there are lots of famous people, but all my pictures are of the sort of crumbling tombs and none of them are the famous stuff. I came home with a whole... Now, these days, a phone full of photographs, and there won't be a single picture of me or my husband. There'll be 
300 grave sites. <laughs> a little obsessive. Yeah, so, so was that where you got the bug? Actually, I got the bug in Highgate, where we had not intended to go to London at all. We were on our way to Spain, and this was as the first Gulf War was starting. So, you know, we missed connection after connection trying to get across the ocean. And while we were flying to England to pick up another connection, the U.S. started to bomb Baghdad. And we decided maybe we ought to stay in a country where we speak the language and can understand what's going on, watch the news, that sort of thing. And while we were there, we were in Victoria Station. There was a little bookstore. And I wandered in and picked up this book of just these luminous cemetery photos that was Victorian Valhalla, a cemetery book about Highgate Cemetery. And Mason said, my husband said, you know, we should go. He'd rather go see that than go to the Tower of London. So that's what we did the last day of our trip. And uh, Highgate was a Victorian cemetery founded, geez, I want to say in the 1870s. And uh, at the, it's a, a high ground, so it looks down over the city. It was very popular for people to come and picnic. But as time went on, and after the First World War and the flu pandemic and the Second World War, there were fewer and fewer families to take care of their graves, and the cemetery began to lose money. and Eventually fell into disrepair and was locked. So it was taken over by a friend's group. It was one of the first friends groups to rescue a cemetery, and they still, all these decades later, still take care of it. But when we were there in the 1980s, it was still pretty run down. One side of it at that point was closed unless you went on a tour, and the other side was fairly wild. And again, since it was January, we were the only people in the place. But you'd turn a corner, and there'd be an angel, and she'd be completely overgrown with ivy, except maybe her face was sticking out or one arm pointing toward heaven. It was so amazingly beautiful. And I thought, geez, I just got to see this. <laughs> Everywhere we go, you know, I have to look for sculptures and angels specifically. I went to Highgate probably, I want to say maybe seven, eight years ago now. And we went in the high summer and it was so green like the yeah. color of the deep green, because there's almost, there's a lot of uh, trees and overgrowth. As you say, a lot of the graves are overgrown and, and nature is it, it, clawing it back all the time. Because it's a pretty big, the, the side I'm thinking of, you obviously know it, the, the side with all the bigger graves, the older graves. It was so green. All my photos have this sort of green tinge as if nature just was there with the dead. Isn't that amazing? We went, geez, I think it was four years ago now in high summer. And it was a day when a thunderstorm was rolling in. And so it was, the light was this odd orange color, but it made the green of all those trees, you know, just an amazing palette of green. It's so much more vivid. Mm, it's a lovely it's, place. It is. Yeah. Maybe it's because it's highlighted against the stone that it makes that color stronger in our memory and in our photos. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's interesting that you had the same experience. So I want to, circling back, we'll come back to some f fun graves in a minute. But I, it's funny, you, I looked on your Instagram just before we got on and you're putting together a logo for your Morbid Lauren business, which I love. And it's, I love that you fact that you're claiming this word morbid because I feel like people say this to me, oh, you're so morbid or why do you think about death and why do you go visit graveyards why do you like associating with death on your holidays <laughs> so when people mm -hmm. ask you that what do you say I don't think it's morbid at all and and then somebody will accuse me of being death obsessed and uh, for me it's the opposite I am life obsessed I know we've just got a certain number of days so why wouldn't you spend it out in the sunshine listening to bird song? and looking at beautiful art. <laughs> what have you got to do with your life that's better than that? Yeah, I don't know. I just don't see cemeteries as morbid at all. I think it's, it's beautiful that we remember people. There are all these amazing stories in the cemetery that you can learn with a tour guide is the best way, but even just walking around and looking at the stones and reading the, the lovely old names and trying to make guesses about the iconography and their uh, days of 
birth and death. I just, I don't know. It's a way of connecting with the past that looking at architecture doesn't do for me. Mm. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. And I think the memento mori of going to a graveyard, the sort of remember you will die at some point, as you say, life obsessed because this is inevitable (laughs) and it feels we're recording this during the pandemic of 2020 and it feels like perhaps people are getting a bit of a wake-up call around the fact that death is inevitable (laughs) and and, yeah and that kind of that so therefore it is important to concentrate on how much you can make of your life exactly don't let a day pass because you have a gift to bring to the world why wait for the time the perfect time when you've got hours to sit and concentrate. Isn't that what we've all been wishing for is time to sit down and read all those books we've been saving and write that novel. You know, this is it. This is your moment. Let's do it now. And in fact, you mentioned they're sitting down. I often sit down in cemeteries and write. There are often, obviously, there are benches where you can sit and contemplate. And I, I feel like often in cities, the cemetery, the graveyards are some of the places, as you said, about birdsong and nature and sculpture. You can actually find a sort of oasis in a big city there, as opposed to, say, in a park where people might be noisy and lots of things happening. Mm-hmm. I, that's exactly it for me. I, I tend to get overwhelmed when we travel because my husband likes to walk and <laughs> he will walk till my legs fall off. And it's really nice to be able to look forward to having a quiet green place and maybe smell some flowers and if you're lucky, see some squirrels or butterflies or rabbits, or any number of things. And it's that sense of peace can help you recharge and then be ready to go out and walk some more. But I, I, I look forward to it. I think Oasis is the perfect word for it. So let's talk about some of the different places you visited and also have written about. Let's start with the above ground tomb. So you mentioned Père Lachaise there, which is definitely one of the uh, obvious examples and beautiful examples. But what are some of the other above ground tomb places that you've visited and, and recommend? I went several years ago to Grant's tomb in Manhattan, and that was uh, that was eye opening. It's the biggest mausoleum in the U.S. So it's enormous. It's, geez, I'd like to say 40 feet, 50 feet high. And it's the only people buried there are Grant and his wife, Julia. But it's huge. And when it was originally opened, it was a big tourist destination. When we were there, oh, it was several years after 9-11, there was no one there. It was just the two of us and the, the ranger. and it gives you that Hasimandias feeling here. Look on my works and despair. Here is somebody who was very important in his day and who's pretty much forgotten now. I know you've talked on your podcast about the tombs in New Orleans. And that's that comes out of the Paralishes, the, the above ground graves in Europe. But in, in New Orleans, they've got the, the oh, public tombs where a society will buy a a huge mausoleum and then anyone who belongs to that society can be buried there so they're all jumbled up together inside and I I think that's really neat that there's no separation once people are dead they're they're all stored together in there yeah the architecture is the one aspect of cemeteries that I don't know as well as I should I must say the New Orleans St. Louis number one, which is the the main one, and you go on the tour and it really is an incredible place and it's mo- much smaller than I expected. I know there are some oh, bigger tiny. yeah, there are some bigger ones that are a bit further out, but that one is is tiny. Just in, in case people don't know, why build above ground tombs? It it varies. Uh, sometimes the ground is too rocky. That's often the case in the Mediterranean countries. In New Orleans, the water table is high, and so there are graveyards where people are buried in the ground, but it's uncommon there that more tombs are built above ground so that you don't have to contend with the water floating things back up. Yeah, exactly. And and I wondered, like you mentioned, with was it Grant's mausoleum? It's actually more dominant in a landscape, and whereas if you're buried underground, I guess you could build some really big 
stone on top. But if you have a something tall and big, it, it's just a much more uh, a bigger marker. The, the burying people in the ground and then raising something over them goes back to the barrows in England, right? Outside of Stonehenge, there are all those barrow tombs where they'd put the king in there and then all his stuff, and then they'd raise a hill over it. And and there are grapes like that in the U.S. too. Some of the, I think it's the Adena people in Ohio, prehistoric to Westerners, but they raise these huge earth mounds. And that's true out here in California as well, where the people would raise a shell mound and bury their dead and build their village on top of it so they could be there with their people. The the sense of marking graves and making changing the landscape, I guess, goes back to the Neanderthals. And I think that's really cool that we have this continuity that it's important to us to know where our dead are buried. And what are some of your favorite burial grounds like that where the bodies are underground? I guess people the most common church people think of a churchyard those bodies are usually underground any beautiful ones spring to mind i went to the old jewish cemetery in prague years ago and that one particularly struck me because the graveyard's in the heart of the ghetto and jews were not allowed to be buried anywhere else but that one little patch of land for centuries this dates back to the 1300s so they didn't have any option but to bring in more dirt and raise the level of the graveyard and they pull all the headstones up to the surface bury the next level of people bring in some more dirt raise the headstones up and again and so the cemetery itself is seven layers deep and as you walk around it the walls of the cemetery tower over your head because They've raised the level of the ground so many times. That to me is amazing that there's centuries of people buried together there. And the cemetery itself is really beautiful. I was there in the autumn and all the leaves were yellow and drifted up against these old gray and slightly pink stones. And, And the iconography was really pretty. They were pictures and hands and birds and lions and things that you don't often see on in other graveyards that, you know beyond the Jewish faith that is a beautiful graveyard I've also been there and we went in the winter we went for new year and uh, visited and of course the the I, I find the Hebrew language as well is just incredibly beautiful because you, you can't mm-hmm. read it but the lines of the letters just f- mm-hmm. feel just really pleasing and then of course there's uh, the stones Jewish people put stones on a grave in remembrance so you walk around and some of the graves there's a famous rabbi buried there who there are always stones on his grave you're right that one does stand out it's so different than anything else what about any other places where the sort of churchyards, I'm obviously I'm in Europe and we have so many here, but I, when I think of America, obviously we've mentioned New Orleans, but are there such elaborate graveyards in the US as there are in, in Europe? Oh yeah. I went on a, a trip one year. I felt like there were holes in my graveyard education. So I we went on a trip to the East Coast, rented a car and drove around and I wanted to see the cemeteries that had been inspired by Père Lachaise. So first among those we had to see Mount Auburn, which is it's in Cambridge, outside of Boston in Massachusetts. And it's spectacular. It was designed specifically to be a graveyard where nature would predominate. And so the, the graves are tucked in and they're lovely, but the, the nature is the really eye-catching, spectacular part. And there are lakes and hills and little dells and everything is designed to, to make you feel like you're in the Garden of Eden, that this is a heaven should be a lovely, beautiful place like this. And that was the first one we went to. We drove up to... Providence, Rhode Island, and went to Swan Point Cemetery, which is probably the most beautiful cemetery I've ever seen. And I think that's, it's a factor of we were there in the spring. Swan Point is, it overlooks the river, so it's up on high ground. 
and it is full of these lovely old trees, all of which were blooming when we were there. And so there were just these spectacular weeping cherries and apple trees and you know, petals fluttering on the breeze as we walked around the graves. And it was, it was really beautiful. And one of those moments where you, you were so glad to be alive in this place at this moment. I don't know if you could get that feeling just walking around a park, maybe, but the, the sense of being alive when so many people don't have that luxury anymore, it, it was really remarkable, I think, uh, just spectacularly pretty. Yeah, I was thinking about in terms of in beautiful locations, I visited this very remote cemetery on the Shetland Islands with this sort of stark (laughs) ocean, Mm -hmm. the North Sea in front of it. And it just felt, wow, this really is the end of the earth. And yet, and I was walking alone and there was an oncoming um, hail storm and it just felt so wild, but so beautiful that this graveyard was on this prime sort of landscape looking out to the ocean and the graves were looking out to the ocean and the text on the graves rather than, so you would almost have to stand and they had the view rather than you, which was fascinating. Mm -hmm. The book I'm working on now is beautiful cemeteries around the world, just specifically picking them for their beauty. And there's one in Monaco that faces the Mediterranean where Roger Moore is buried. A bunch of famous people are buried there, Le Mans drivers, all kinds of people. But the, the fact that, like you say, the graves are facing the water, they're looking out at this spectacular view, is so pretty. Mm-hmm. I love that about cemeteries. One of the ones I've been to is in the heart of Yosemite Valley, where you're surrounded by all this grandeur and these towering trees and those enormous mountains and the waterfalls and all of that. On the very heart of it, there's a cemetery where the original people who you know opened the first hotel in the valley, the original caretakers, are were gathered from. Uh, when they originally died, they were buried where they fell. But uh, at some point, all of their graves were gathered together into this tiny little cemetery. And it's, uh, what better place to be than the place that you loved and you spent your life trying to protect and now you're there eternally. That's really cool. (laughs) It, It is. And then another thing that I think we have quite a few of in Europe is the catacombs and the ossuaries, Mm -hmm. which is essentially a lot of the times it was plague dead and there just weren't enough places. So they dug up the bones and in Paris, they arrange all the bones into interesting shapes. And so I wondered, like, what are some of those catacombs or ossuaries that you particularly uh, like? Well, the thing that fascinates me about the, the ossuaries is that I originally, in the Middle Ages, the belief was you needed to have all your pieces on Judgment Day. When Gabriel sounded his horn, you had to be able to pull yourself back together and walk before the throne of God. And if you couldn't find a piece, that would be a problem. So they couldn't part with anybody's bones. They, they didn't necessarily need to have them in the ground but or even connected to each other. But they needed to save them all because people would need those. One of the most amazing places I've been is the Church of the Immaculate Conception in Rome. Have you been there? No, I don't think so. Oh, my goodness. It's, it's not very big. It's basically seven little chapels. But when the Capuchin monks moved from, they had a farm outside of the city, they moved into town. They dug up all their dead and brought them with them. And one of the monks was charged with arranging these bones in the chapels and making beautiful, holy art out of that. And it's playful. They've taken the bones and they've made chandeliers and garlands. And there's a room where the ceiling has death, which, you know, that was easy. They just put a skeleton together, but he's holding a scythe made of bones. And there are winged hourglasses that are made of bones, everything, all the artwork is made of bones. And it could be morbid it could be scary or upsetting or whatever but it's not the sense you get that this is really joyful that they are looking forward to the time where they can pull all these bones back together and and go home i don't know i've been to a couple of catacombs but it's one of those places where like you say they there aren't anything 
but there isn't anything like that here in the U.S. I have to make a pilgrimage to see those. Yeah, I think that sounds very much Sedlets in in the Czech Republic, just outside of Prague, the uh, the bone church there, which is similar with the the chandeliers and the sort of these towering sculptures, and it it just fe- it feels abstract, as you said, it's holy art. It doesn't make mm-hmm. you think of the dead in a way, you know. I went there for my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> We so we we would so get on like that's exactly the type of thing I do on my birthday. <laughs> well, we were in Prague, which I've heard about my whole life, but it seemed just impossibly far and difficult to get to. And my husband said, "What do you want to do for your birthday?" And I said, "Geez, I I really like to go to Kutna Hora and see the ossuary." So that's what we did, and it turned out to be an epic journey because we couldn't read the train schedules and ended up on a local. So it was a longer trip than we intended, but it was so worth it that the place is just, it's not very big, but it's got 40,000 people buried in it and just mounds of skulls. And there's a coat of arms formed of bones. Do you remember that? Where Mm, you see the, the bird pecking, the bird is made of bones and it's pecking a skull and just amazing. You think, Jeez, how did they do this? Did they spread them all out? So you had all the vertebrae together, and all the skulls in one pile, and then they decide, I need to have this piece. Let me take that block and put it, or did they just grab what was to hand and say, okay, let, what can we make with this? Amazing stuff. It is. And what do you think? I feel like a lot of Americans think it's quite weird to have these ossuaries and these catacombs full of bones because it's not something that you have in North America. Do you, is mm-hmm. it literally because there just aren't these big mass graves in the, the, where they didn't do it historically? Do you think that sort of style has gone out of fashion as such? I, here in America, most places, they, they don't have much respect for the dead, I guess is the way I want to say it. I live in San Francisco, and there aren't any active graveyards here. They move them all out. Uh, the last of them was kicked out in the 40s. And they, they pretty much, it took them 40 years. The, the city fathers decided, we're, we're on a peninsula, we're bounded by water on three sides. And the cemeteries had prime land. So hmm. they'd much rather build houses there. So it took years to talk the people of San Francisco into saying, okay, yes, dig the graves up. But they pretty much dug up anybody whose family hadn't picked them up and moved them and put them in mass graves. And they're just, one of them is a field that's surrounded by a chain link fence. There are 20,000 people buried there, but you can't visit it. You can't, there's no indication of who those people were. And some of the people that are in these mass graves were, the founding fathers of the city in Cypress Lawn, their mass grave is has a little more respect to it. But Andrew Holiday, who is the the man who designed the cable cars, which San Francisco is known for, but Holiday's buried in a mass grave. Then anywhere else in the world, this guy would have some respect, but not in the U.S. I think that's some of it is that for a lot of places in the U.S., the dead are an inconvenience. And once families aren't there taking care of the graves and advocating for their dead, the city feels thoroughly justified in just plowing over them or in some cases not even moving the bodies, but just building on top of them. Yeah, it's fascinating. And I guess our modern, like my own will says, cremate me. Because Mm -hmm. one, I think we have almost, there's a financial aspect of having a grave plot and a full on headstone. And people might not realise that often you have to pay for the the years. It's not like Mm -hmm. just buy it and you've got it for the the end of time. And I I feel like maybe the cultural attitude to to death, as you say, it's, it is very different. The the use of the physical body in art, which is what we were just talking about there with the ossuaries, Mm -hmm. it's just something that's not fit with a sort of modern idea of what death is. Mm -hmm. There are a number of places now that will take cremains and make art out of them. And so it's the same thing. My cat passed on and he was my muse. 
So I've had his ashes on my desk for, I don't know, 10 years now, because I can't seem to part with him. But I found a place that will make paperweights out of cremated remains. And so I have this beautiful piece of artwork where I can remember him. It's not the same as having a mobile or whatever made out of his bones, but people don't look at me twice when I have this paperweight on my desk. (laughs) I think you're right. I think the sensibility is changing. We're just faced with the reality now that people don't stay in the same community for generations the way they used to. And so why would you have a grave in a place where your family doesn't live anymore? We're on a, I don't know, a precipice is not the word I want, but we're at a moment where where things are changing and, and maybe even more with this pandemic where you know, we're seeing the, the fragility of not only life, but of eternity that mm. who will be here to remember us. Yeah, and it is, even if you have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, I don't know who my great-grandparents were. Some people do. There are some religious traditions particularly that trace all those things back. But yeah, it really is about what can you do in your lifetime. And it, it is fascinating. But the the other thing I think is interesting right now is that you can, even if you get cremated, there are all these different levels of, you can have the really expensive coffin with all the brass bits that obviously is great. <laughs> or you can go with a sort of wicker basket with flowers, or you can get a natural burial. Or I talk about it with my mum. She's very open to talking about these things. And we've, we have a laugh about it and talk about that. But I, I think things are starting to I almost feel things are going the other way that there is a rejection of some of the the overly fake death rituals and going back Mm -hmm. to a sort of more natural style yeah I one of the uh, cemeteries that's in 199 cemeteries is an underwater cemetery where you can have your cremated remains mixed into cement and then they make art out of them and they sink them to the floor of the ocean and then corals grow on it or fish come around and it's taking that sense of permanency and memory keeping but making beauty out of it and allowing nature to I don't know colonize it maybe um Mm, life continues Mm. exactly and I know there's some similar things in the UK where they're they're making these pyramids and dropping them into the water, I want to say Solace Reef, where they're designed for lobsters to come and the, the little lobsters can live in the crevices of the rock and until it's they're big enough to be safe in the open ocean. And I just find that idea really beautiful that mm. somehow by my death, I can help the planet. There's something life affirming about that. There is. And then I, I was also thinking, and then we catch the lobster and eat it for dinner. And thus is exactly. the circle of life. <laughs> I love that. But like, just talking about food, we actually went for a walk the other day around a local cemetery. And there was, it's not so common in Britain, but there was a family having their their lunch at the grave, mm-hmm. which you, with, with lots of flowers. And you see it much more commonly, I think, in where I've been in the Pacific Islands, for example, or places where you have, on, or in Mexico, I, I think, also on Day of the Dead or whatever, you go and visit the ancestors and you eat at the grave side. And it's almost like you're inviting them to the party. That's not in my culture as an English person, <laughs> but I well, find but that it, it interesting. It used to be 100 years ago, that was very common to, to take a picture and go sit in the cemetery, maybe not 100 years, let's say 150 years, because prior to that, there weren't any city parks, right? Only rich people could afford land that was natural. Everybody else lived crowded in the cities and there weren't parks or you know trees or greenery, anything like that. So if you needed to escape, you went to the cemetery and people would picnic and court and read books and do what we're doing now, reclaiming it and and appreciating life a little bit. And so in the intervening years, that's fallen out of fashion. And now people think it's unusual, but it not that long ago, it was common. So I love the idea of having a a cemetery picnic and Mm. (laughs) asking the ghosts to come along. (laughs) 
Yeah, and it's interesting. I I wanted to ask you as well uh, whether you uh, do feel a supernatural and or spiritual aspect, something that is not physical when you visit a graveyard, or if you've had any experiences like that, or whether it truly is the most physical place where physical bodies go back to the earth. I have had an experience. There's a cemetery across the bay in Oakland, California, that it's beautiful. It's built on a a hillside so it overlooks the water in San Francisco in the distance and uh, some of the wealthy families of San Francisco and the Bay Area have these amazing family tombs up on a hill but a friend of mine organized this little ghost hunting tour there were seven of us and we started at uh, sunset roaming around in there with a guide from the cemetery and as we walked through the potter's field we discovered a gravestone and the the guide said, oh, I had no idea there were stones here. It's a potter's field. Often those graves aren't marked at all, but we dug it out and I got this strange feeling. The back of my neck got really cold and got a crick in it. I thought, geez, this is weird. It was warm that evening and still there wasn't a breath of wind. And one of the women came over and said, you're standing funny. What's going on? I said, I don't know. My neck really hurts. And one of the other women was a psychic. She came over and she said, oh, this, the woman that's buried here was a servant. And she fell or was pushed or somehow was induced to throw herself down the stairs. She broke her neck. She was pregnant with the, the son of the family she works for child and and i don't know that was a ghostly experience but it was i was wow i can't even talk about it now it was a really (laughs) strange sensation that i was so happy to move away from that just that one moment where you know we discovered her stone we didn't even know she was there and then suddenly there was this whole story that unfolded from her i i don't know if that was ghostly or just a weird coincidence whether Mm. the psychic took my discomfort and the name and spun a story out of it or not. But I, I'd like to believe in ghosts. I don't really require any evidence because I'd like to feel like we can continue, that death isn't the absolute end. I don't know. I, I haven't had as many experiences as I've been to graveyards. I've been to a lot of graveyards. But yeah. I don't know. Something happens and you're just like, I have no logical explanation for this. Yeah, it's interesting. I really haven't had anything like that, even though I've been on ghost tours and I've been on these things at night, Edinburgh at night, ghost oh, really? walks and things like that. And and it's funny, I, I have had experiences where I feel more like awe and wonder, where I feel mm-hmm. almost transcendence. I'm not a Christian, if that's God or spirit or whatever people want to call it, but that sense of the world is bigger than just me, which I find liberating. I Mm -hmm. feel that feeling is a good feeling. And yeah, and I think that does come back to the memento mori as as we started with, realising, yeah, this is life and and that's fantastic. So we are almost out of time. We could talk about this all day, but I wonder (laughs) if you can recognise... So I absolutely love your books, 199 Cemeteries to See Before You Die and Wish You Were Here, particularly. I know you've got some more coming out. But what are some other books that you would recommend about cemeteries or set in cemeteries or places of death? One of the best ones as an overview of cemetery history is The American Resting Place by Marilyn Yulam. It is focused on America, but it starts with the the native history and goes through all the different waves of styles of cemeteries and it's just really readable and you know easy to understand let's see i made a list because i knew i would i would never remember all these stories in stone a field guide to cemetery symbolism and iconography by douglas keister is probably the best book that illustrates what you're looking at when you see a gravestone what does uh three links of a chain or the all seeing eye of God, or you know, what do the images that you see mean? And that is worldwide. He is one of the most traveled cemetery historians and it's beautifully illustrated, full of color pictures. 
I just read Necropolis, London and It's Dead by Catherine Arnold. Oh, uh, I don't yeah, know that's if you've a great that book. One. Yeah, I have. Oh, yeah. I, she is so good at making all the history of London come alive. And it's so rich compared to San Francisco was founded in 1776. So it's really <laughs> not that old compared to London. The Empire of Death, A Cultural History of Ossuaries and Charnel Houses by Paul Cudineris is, it's spectacularly beautiful. He is. I really love amazing. all his books. Yeah, they're yeah. amazing. Yeah. And it's, it makes it seem less creepy. He has such a gift of taking these things that, you know, from a Western point, from a modernist point, uh, they seem weird, these death rituals, and he makes them perfectly understandable and he, he he has a gift for making you really feel connected to the people of the past and then the last one i wanted to mention is a brand new one that came out last year sacred ground the cemeteries of new orleans by robert brantley he instead of standing at the grave and saying oh this is this kind of stone and it's got this kind of iconography he got curious about the people buried there. And so it's pretty much the story of one man's curiosity as he roamed around the cemeteries of New Orleans and poked into who these people were and why they're remembered. And some of them are famous people, but many of them are not. And the stories he comes up with are really wonderful. Yeah, that's five. It's a, It was hard for me to pick five because <laughs> I've read hundreds. Yes. And you actually have lots of extra reading and things on your website. So why don't you tell people where they can find you and everything you do online? My cemetery website is cemeterytravel.com. And it's, geez, it's a record of my fixation. I talk about cemeteries that I visited. I post photographs from people who've been to cemeteries that I haven't been able to see yet. And it's going to be, starting now, it's going to be research for the new cemetery book I'm working on, the, the world's most beautiful cemetery. So, that, oh, yeah, cemeterytravel.com. I will look forward to that book. <laughs> and thank you so much for your time, Lauren. That was great. Thank you so much for having me. I, when you wrote and said you had, you were a taphophile, I was great. Finally, somebody who totally understands this, I could talk about anything. I think it's getting more common and fewer people are freaked out about it. But every now and then I meet somebody who's you spend your vacations in cemeteries. <laughs> oh yeah. I think everybody ought to. <laughs> exactly. Thanks for joining me today on the books and travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at books and travel page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.